Hi. Uh, I want to talk about Winter Girls. Basically, this is a book I really liked a lot and I read a million times when I was in middle school. At the time, I didn't really realize how dumb and harmful and damaging this book is, but as an adult, you know, looking back, there's a lot wrong with this book. Like, a lot, a lot. And uh, that's what I want to talk about. I have a couple of pages of notes here. I could write forever about all the stupid shit that's in this book, just to be frank, but we'd be here all day. Instead, I'm just gonna go over all the, like, major flaws of the book and some of the, like, giant no-nos that nobody should ever, ever do if they're trying to write a book like this. So, I don't have a physical copy of it because there's no fucking way I'm gonna actually give this author my money. Not that I have anything against her, it's just... It feels a little bit wrong. Instead, I just googled it and wouldn't you know it, the first thing that comes up when you google Winter Girls is a PDF of it. Got that PDF right here on my laptop. I held up the pages and said laptop. I'm smart. We're gonna go through some shit. Oh, number one. Number one complaint through the whole book. Constantly listing the fucking calorie counts of everything. You should never do that. First of all, uh, it says in the back of the book that the author consulted with someone who's worked on an eating disorder unit for 20 years. And I guess that person never really told her that numbers are like the biggest no when it comes to eating disorders and treatment and such. So, you know, I can get why, like, I can get why she put them in there. It's for realism's sake, but in actuality, it's pretty harmful to just be throwing around numbers every single time the main character eats something. It is a realistic portrayal of anorexia, don't get me wrong. But you also have to consider the fact that this book is most likely going to be read by people who are suffering from some kind of eating disorder. And a lot of them are teen young girls, at least according to my anecdotal research. And people are really impressionable, especially when they're trying to get into this kind of dark side of like Proanna, which is touched on in the book pretty oddly too, if I might add. Recovery in this book is pretty demonized, as you would expect, until the main character meets a boy. Great, so now we have the age-old trope of damsel in distress. It's a little bit well, it's more than a little bit cliche. It's very cliche to have the main character suddenly lose all of her disordered thoughts for a moment just because she's with a boy. I, I don't know how many people that's realistic for. But I can tell you for me, it's completely unrealistic. You know, mental illness doesn't just, doesn't just quit when, you know, when you meet a cute boy. If it did, I think we'd all be, you know, pretty good, pretty okay up here. Her parents, I don't know what the fuck is going on with her parents. I'm like... I get it, you know, having a kid starve herself to death, essentially, it's pretty traumatic, right? But her mother is a doctor, and she doesn't seem to understand that, you know, weight restoration doesn't equal recovery, so that's another thing. <laughs> One of the biggest problems I have with this book is definitely the romanticizing language. Now, if you've read this, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the main character, her name's Leah, L-I-A, because why would you spell it L-E-A-H? That's not different enough. Page seven. So that's pretty early on. I waste really no time establishing the writer's, you know, stylistic choices and the way she's gonna present this girl's story to you. It's pretty obvious right off the bat how it's gonna go. You get a good feel of what the character is like in a few pages, which is good. I'm not gonna, you know, diss on her for that. So on page seven, this is written from the first person's perspective, of course. So, the main character says, I won't pollute my insides with blueberry dazzle pops or muffins or scritch scratchy shards of toast either. Yesterday's dirt and mistakes have moved through me. I am shiny and pink inside. Clean. Empty is good. Empty is strong. I want to mention that empty is strong, strong slash empty slash strong is mentioned countless times throughout this book. So it's basically like the main character's mantra. Like, the more she starves herself, the stronger she is. So anyone who's not from a disordered perspective obviously isn't going to look at this and be like, that's a great idea. I should be strong and starve myself. But if you're already predisposed and you're already feeling shitty about how you look and you're curious about eating disorders and you're thinking, you know, maybe my way out is to start purging or is to start starving, that's really fucking damaging. It's damaging for me. I'm sure it's damaging for all kinds of other people because all it really takes is Googling winter girls and looking at my pro and there's just all these threads about people using it as their fucking inspiration. What are we doing? This is... This is crazy. Don't do this. Please don't do this. More on the romantic bullshit language. We've got page 19. I should really just be using controller, shouldn't I? This is the scene where Leah comes back to school for, I guess, the first time since, um, oh, spoiler alert, her friend is dead. 
I don't think you really care. It doesn't... whatever. Her friend is dead. She's going back to school for the first time since that happened, and I guess either she really thinks she's this important that everyone in the school is talking about her specifically and not the dead girl, or this is just all in her head. Dead girl walking, the boys say in the halls. Tell us your secret, the girls whisper, one toilet to another. I am that girl. I am the space between my thighs, daylight shining through. That line in particular really pisses me off. Can we stop acting like this fucking majestic fucking thigh gap is like the end of the fucking world? Like if you don't have that shit, you're basically a fat sack of shit. Can we stop? Can we stop? <laughs> I am the bones they want, wired on a porcelain frame. So obviously this main character glamorizes the actual shit out of her own self and the author just kind of fucking all over it. This is like a pro and a fucking guide in some time. I eat half a grapefruit, 150. No sugar, zero. I only eat half of that half of a grapefruit, 75. Fuck you. Fuck you, Leah. Page 52. As I step on the scale, blah blah blah. As I step on the scale, blah blah blah. As I step on the scale, bloody 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 fucking blah. So here's her justifying her being underweight again. They're morons. This body has a different metabolism. This body hates dragging around the chains they wrap around it. Proof? At 99, I think clearer. Look better. Feel stronger. When I reach the next goal, it'll be all that and more. Goal number two is 95. The perfect point of balance. At 95, I will be pure, light enough to walk with my head up, meaty enough to fool every- She thinks 95 is meaty. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. Throughout the book, every- every fucking person in- in the entire world except her is a whale, is a lard ass, is full of blubber, is fat as fuck. Now listen, I understand that eating disorders affect your self-perception, but everyone who has an eating disorder doesn't go around thinking everyone else is a fucking fat sack of shit. And I don't think the author knows that. I don't think she actually knows what the fucking eating disorder is. She's never had one. She's only just read about them and she consulted with some doctor. So I guess now she's an expert too or something. It doesn't work like that. Like take, for my personal experience, that was never the way I thought at all. It doesn't, you know, I feel like for most people it's really about yourself and has nothing to do with other people's weight at all. 95, I will have the strength to stay in control. I'll stand on the blocks hidden in the toes of my satin ballet slippers, pink ribbons sewn into my calves, and rise up in the air. Magical. At 90, I will soar. That's goal number three. Give me a fucking break. Page 61. Okay, this is, um, here you can put a trigger warning here. I mean, this whole thing is gonna have trigger warnings. We're talking about some heavy shit, but this is gonna be talking about cutting right here. Leah goes to a drugstore, and what does she get? She gets some razor blades and a scale. And what does she do with the razor blades? Well, she goes to a fucking movie theater with some kids in it and just starts fucking cutting herself. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, no hate. <clears throat> I don't want to get too personal here, but I've struggled with that for years. I don't understand what the motivation was for this, why it had to be in a movie theater, what it does for the plot and story. It really doesn't do anything, and a lot of things in this story feel like She's just driving around so that like the author can build this sort of universe, but it's it feels really small. Everything that, you know, isn't happening with the main character is just sort of on hold, if that makes any sense. Like, the world is pretty stagnant. This is the way she describes cutting herself, which is again, really fucking romanticized. We're talking about slicing open your own skin and opening yourself up to a shit ton of different infections and permanently disfiguring yourself. There's nothing romantic about it, but this is how it's described. <clears throat> The box opens and the razors slide out. Whisper sweet. Used to be that my whole body was my canvas. Hot cuts licking my ribs, ladder rungs climbing my arms, thick milkweed stalks shooting up my thighs. When I moved to Jennifer land, my father made one condition. A daughter who forgets how to eat, well that was bad, but it was just a phase and I was over it. Here's where it gets really fucking cringe, so just buckle in. But a daughter who opens her own tiny skin bag, wanting to let her shell fall to the ground so she can dance. That was just sick. No cutting the American Overbrook. Not in terms of Baltimore deal breaker. I mean, really, when the actual fuck would you ever describe self-harm as wanting to dance and letting your shell fall to the ground? Just fuck you, dude. Fuck. 
I'm actually getting like really offended at some of this shit when I read it over again because I read this book again obviously the other day so I could get all my you know ducks in a row. I really wish I would have filmed myself reading this again because my reactions were just over the top. I hate this kind of thing. It really reminds me of like Tumblr and those depression blogs where it's like, you know, being dead would be better. Everyone hates me. <sighs> Can we just fucking stop now, please? All right, what's next on the list? Oh, right. So this author just gets deeper and deeper and deeper into purple prose, like the longer this goes on and it gets really cringe and really painful to read. She's talking about how her and her friend used to like go to the mall and her friend would binge because her friend is bulimic and she would guard the toilet while her friend purged into the toilet. She's like, she asked me to guard the door, blah, blah, blah. We held hands when we walked down the gingerbread path into the forest, blood dripping from our fingers. We danced with the witches and kissed monsters. We turned into winter girls. And when we tried to leave, I pulled her back into the snow because I was afraid to be alone. The blood from the fingertips is referencing this dumb shit where her and her friend cut their palm and make like a blood sacrifice. This is a really good way to get someone's like diseases by the way, please don't do that. <laughs> stupid. Really stupid. Doesn't add anything to the story, it's just flowery dumb writing about girls in a competition to kill themselves over food. Why? Alright. I was originally going to talk about how some of the calorie counts are wrong, but I don't think it even matters. Like, who fucking cares? All this book is wrong, so of course the calorie counts are going to be wrong. I have a section here titled, Stupid Shit, and it says, page 11. Whole page. Woo, can't wait to see what that's like. I know this is all over the place. This is like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just shitting on this book, and if you want to shit on it too, then just keep watching. Right, so this is when Leah is going through her grief about her friend dying, and the fact that, you know, her friend, she didn't pick up her friend's phone calls when her friend was dying in a motel room. She asked me to listen and told me this wouldn't take long. I was the root of all evil, Cassie said, a negative influence, a toxic shadow. While I was locked up, her parents had dragged her to a doctor who washed her brain and weighed her down with pills and empty words. She needed to move on with her life, redefine her boundaries, she said. I was the reason she cut classes and failed French, because of everything nasty and dangerous. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I was the reason she didn't run away freshman year. I was the reason she didn't eat a bottle of sleeping pills when her boyfriend cheated on her. I listened for hours when her parents yelled and tried to stuff her in a mannequin shell that didn't fit. I understood what triggered her earthquakes, most of them. It was probably partially you, just saying. Considering you guys were in a fucking competition to starve yourselves, I don't think you should be patting yourself on the back. I knew how much it hurt to be the daughter of people who can't see you, not even if you're standing in front of them stomping your feet. No shit, if you're a grown woman, Leah, you're 19. If you're standing in front of your parents stomping your feet as a 19 year old, no shit they're not gonna see you or listen to you. That's what children do. But remembering all that was too complicated for Cassie. It was easier for her to dump me one last time. She turned my summer into a desert wasteland. <laughs> when school started, she looked right through me in the halls. Her new friends draped around her neck like Mardi Gras necklaces. She wiped me off the face of her existence. Wow, Cassie, you're so fucking mean. How could you get new friends and not want to hang out with the person who encourages you to kill yourself and is partially the reason why you're dead right now? How could you, bitch? Oh, you're so mean, Cassie. Wow. Too bad she can't fucking defend herself, isn't it? Oh, this bitch sure runs her mouth a lot about her dead friend. But her dead friend can't really say shit now, can she? There's kids in school who are like, you didn't, you know, you weren't a good friend to Cassie. Why are you crying? And she just freaks the fuck out. Maybe because you weren't a good friend, Leah. Maybe you were a shitty friend. Maybe you were fucking terrible influences on each other. Go figure. That's never realized once in the book, though. It's just this back and forth between her and a dead girl. It just, it's these things that take you out of the universe and remind you that you are reading just a really stupid book and nothing about this is remotely true. Or realistic. Or, or relatable. I can't relate to this. I probably could when I was like 13, but even then, this girl's 19. Age 28. She's talking about being in recovery for the first time here. She was forced to go to an inpatient place because she was underage and she crashed her friend's car, totaled it. She's here now, in, in the past, and um, she says, I ate and ate. They stuffed me like a pink little piggy ready for market. They killed me with mushy apples and pasta worms and little cakes that marched out of the oven and lay down to be frosted. I bit, chewed, swallowed, day after day, and lied, lied, lied. Who wants to recover? It took me years to get that tiny. I wasn't sick, I was strong. You know, the only people I've ever heard describe themselves like this are people who are openly pro-anorexia. 
That doesn't bode well, does it? But staying strong... <laughs> Isn't that funny? Stay strong is used in like mental health community. You can be okay, you can recover, you can do this. She's using it like, yes, I can keep fucking starving myself. Stay strong. Alright. But staying strong would keep me locked up. The only way out was to shove in food until I waddled. So she probably gained like three pounds just waddling, you know. Okay, so on page 32, this is um a big inconsistency here. Well, not it's not really that big. It's big to me because I just noticed stupid shit like this. Basically, um... Leah, she eats too many rice cakes, she wants to puke, but she can't, so what does she do? She takes a laxative, but she doesn't shit, and she just like, goes to school the next day, and she's fine, but then later on in the book, she takes two more laxatives, and she like, shits her guts out and feels like she's dying? I didn't know if they were laxatives at first, but it's mentioned on page 184 that she goes into that same box and they are in fact laxatives. The parents are totally fucking obsessed with this girl's numbers to the point where they, they used to weigh her every single day. And it's like, okay, your mom's a fucking physician. She wasn't the one weighing her, it was her stepmom. But her mom's a fucking physician. Surely she would mention at some point, you know, your weight will fluctuate every day. Everyone loses and gains a few pounds every day. It's really ineffective to weigh someone every day. It would make more sense to weigh them weekly. What do I know, right? I'm, I'm not a fucking doctor. She's been in therapy for two years, but her parents are still obsessing over numbers. Everyone's like, oh, you're still at such and such weight. It's like, yeah, but shouldn't you be focusing more on her behaviors and not about the number? Because the whole fucking thing is about the number and maybe you should get her mind off of that instead of constantly talking about it. And when she's talking about how she's gonna be light and soaring when she's at 90 pounds or whatever, when she crashed and totaled her friend's car, she was 89 pounds and hadn't eaten in one day. But then, but then she's able to spend three or four hours on a stair stepper without eating for the whole day or even longer before. That just doesn't make any fucking sense, first of all. And second of all, it double doesn't make any sense because by the second time around, she would be weaker, not stronger. I know she thinks she's stronger because she's starving herself better, but actually, realistically, she would be weaker. She wouldn't be able to be on a stair stepper for four hours every night. She just wouldn't. Like, if you can't drive a car for 10 kilometers to get to your high school, sure as shit you're not gonna be on a fucking stair stepper. So I don't know why the author got that. I know overexercising is part of anorexia, we all know that. I just don't think that's realistic. I just don't. You're like, what are you gonna tell me next? You run a fucking 5k <laughs> after eating an apple? Like, I just don't buy it. It's page 73. Oh right, this is the part where her parents try and tell her that she can't attend a wake. She's a legal adult. And who the fuck would say that? What fucking parent is like, yeah, I know your best friend growing up that you've known for over a decade is dead, but no, you're not allowed to go to her wake, bitch. Who the fuck says that? No one fucking says that. Don't give me that shit. Nobody says that. You can go to whatever funeral you fucking want or wake or whatever. Do what you want, especially if you're an adult. Just, I don't even know where the fuck the author- She just put that in there for plot conflict, obviously. She just put it in for fucking conflict. There's enough conflict in this book without adding unrealistic stupid shit to it. Come on, man. I'm getting heated. Ugh. Oh, and 90, uh, page 93. This fucking boy- This fucking boy she meets, which, first of all, she describes him as, like, the most disgusting person ever in her own fucking words. She's like, He's broken out like a lava field under his patchy beard and he looks like he doesn't shower and he smells gross, blah blah. And then she wants to fucking fuck him, I guess, or whatever. Then this is just like an untied loose thread in the story that never gets addressed again, ever. Guy, Eli, that she's talking to, convinces her that he's psychic and he has this, this honestly the ugliest sounding tattoo I've ever fucking heard. He rolls up his sleeve to show the tattoo that takes up his entire forearm. A muscular half bull half man thing riding a bike through a wall of flame with wings spreading from its legs and arms and helmet what the fuck what is that and she's like what is that supposed to be and he's like he's the god bike messenger it's cool huh this vision of him came to me one day while i was delivering a package to a law firm in boston so i'm so clearly i thought he'd reach out and choke me he had to go in my skin Okay, maybe you should lay off the fucking drugs or whatever, dude. This is really infuriating for me. I don't know about you. Leah has been given some really 
actually really good spot on advice she's been given like a fucking toolbox full full of coping mechanisms and what does she say about them i bet you can guess what this bitch thinks about those fucking coping mechanisms by the way she's been in therapy for like three years her parents are fucking loaded and she went to a really expensive treatment facility but nowhere in this book are you gonna find a single modicum of gratitude for that at all anywhere not one fucking time is like no this bitch is the most ungrateful bitch in the world she really thinks she has the hardest life in the world and it's fucking exhausting. So, to give me rules for moments like this, identify the feeling, recite affirmations, reread life goals, meditate on positive thoughts, call therapist if negative self-talk continues, maintain required caloric intake and hydration, avoid excessive exercise, alcohol, drug abuse. These are solid, normal things to say to someone who is actively self-destructive. And what does she do? She's like, fuck that. I'm gonna lay on the floor and do a couple hundred crunches, yo. By the way, I just want to say, this specific part has been repeated in how many, I don't even know how many, like, pro Anna blogs I've seen. People actually use this in real life, for real, as a weight loss method. Granted, it's really uncommon. It's only for people who are already obviously eating disordered but the fact that people actually wrote this down and took this into real life and are using it is fucking scary new rules 800 calories a day max 500 preferred a day starts at dinner if they make me eat with them stuff in enough to keep them off my back restrict during the next day to make up for it that's not how life works that isn't how food works that isn't how eating works okay whatever if no breakfast take the bus to school better walk best don't go restart exercise programs sleep with the lights on until they bury her just for some extra edge points in there page 111 here we go boys leah takes her phone and she goes and looks at some pro anna tumblers or whatever except she calls it a are you ready a whisper secret blog a whisper secret blog for girls like me the whisper secret blog says gained 0.5 pounds between breakfast and after school you probably like holy that's fucking water dude that's fucking water you didn't gain half of a pound of fat in a day i swear people who are pro anna are actually this fucking dumb and if you are pro anna i don't know why you're watching this because i've just been shitting on it for like 20 minutes don't do that don't promote a fucking mental illness especially one with the highest mortality rate wow i am such a fat ass you know it's true i want to cut it all off Stay strong, love, love, be perfect. I have two weeks and six days to lose 10 pounds. Help! And she says, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of strange little girls screaming through their fingers. Here's where it gets weird. She's talking about strange little girls and most pro anas are like in their teen years. This bitch is almost 20. I'm gonna be 21 next month. I don't wanna fucking interact with a bunch of teenagers talking about how to star themselves the best. And she calls them her sisters. It's a little weird. Patient sisters, always waiting for me. I scroll through our confessions and rants and prayers, desperation eating us one slow bloody bite at a time. Two flies crash into my lampshade. Buzz buzz. Random leftovers from summer with a few hours left to live. I turn off the lights and they swarm to the computer screen, dancing across to uploads of skinny girl, three R's, ribs and hips and collarbones, bones pulled out of their skin and laid on top so they can dry in the sun. Beautiful when seen through the paper wings of out-of-season flies. So corny shit like this is really fucking popular on Pro Anna Tumblr. All you have to do is look it up. Oh, here's a section called Leah is an asshole. This is my favorite section. She's seriously a fucking asshole. I would not want to talk to this person. She's a terrible fucking person. She triggered her friend on purpose. She triggered Cassie on purpose one time. She talk talks about it and she doesn't seem to really even feel all that bad. She almost went to a doctor two years ago talking about Cassie from the perspective of Leah. The stuffing, puking, stuffing, puking, stuffing, puking didn't make her skinny, it made her cry. Coach bumped her down to the JV soccer squad because she couldn't run fast enough. Drama teacher told her that she wasn't shining bright enough so she didn't get the lead in the play. I can't stop but I can't keep going, she told me. Nothing works. That is probably the only accurate depiction of an eating disorder in this whole book. So great job. It's surrounded by hundreds of pages of shit. Totally supported her. I looked at the names of docs and clinics. I emailed her recovery websites. And I sabotaged every step because I'm Leah and I'm a fucking asshole. I told her how strong she was and how healthy she was going to be and how proud I was of her. And then I dropped in how many calories I ate that day, the magic number on the scales, the number of inches around my thighs. We went to the mall and I made sure we used the same dressing room so she could see my skeleton shine in the fluorescent light. 
oh right, this is where I was talking about before. Just a preamble to when she was, we danced with the witches and kissed monsters. <laughs> Stupid shit. Because obviously the title of the book, Winter Girls, is alluding to the fact that like once they started their eating disorder pact, because they actually did, they started a pact when they were like 11 to be the skinniest girls in school. Um, they became Winter Girls because they were in the snow, so it's super fucking on the nose, no originality. They're Winter Girls because they're dead and cold and dying. Oh, there's also like a ton of typos in this book. There's just a bunch of grammatical mistakes. So if you pick up on those, good for you, because this book had at least two editors, at least, at least two so that's kind of unforgivable page 136 dumb in big letters right now she's at her friend's funeral she's talking about the time that she actually went to her grandmother's funeral when she was young she's like the grave diggers lifted my grandmother's coffin as if it were filled with feathers as they lowered it into the ground the wind blew and ghost shadows unfolded and folded themselves like butterflies on the ground marble girls whispered and ghost shadows stuck inside and hid behind my ribs Basically, this bitch just wanders around constantly thinking the world fucking revolves around her and everything is a ghost and it just lives inside of her because she's just the most spoopy, scary fucking skeleton that ever fucking spooked. Page 161. Cassie's mom, dead girl's mom, asks Leah, Why? Why did my daughter do this to herself? Leah answers, Why? You want to know why? Step into a tanning booth and fry yourself for two or three days. After your skin bubbles and peels off, roll it in coarse salt, then pull on long underwear woven from spun glass and razor wire. Over that goes your regular clothes, as long as they are tight. Smoke gunpowder and go to school and jump through hoops, sit up and beg, and roll over on command. Listen to the whispers that curl into your head at night, calling you ugly and fat and stupid and bitch and whore and worst of all, disappointment. Puke and starve and cut and drink because you don't want to feel any of this. Puke can starve and cut and drink because you need an anesthetic and it works for a while. But then the anesthetic turns into poison and by then it's too late because you are maintaining it now straight into your soul. It is rotting you and you can't stop. Look in a mirror and find a ghost. Hear every heartbeat scream that every single thing is wrong with you. Why is the wrong question. Ask why not. So this is a really dumb interpretation of why someone has an eating disorder and it doesn't answer the question in the slightest way. It's literally just an exercise for the author to just fucking get her purple prose boner off. Basically she's just saying like, God, my life is so fucking hard. I have body image issues, and instead of talking to anyone about it, you know, like my therapist that my parents pay thousands of dollars for, I'm just gonna make up a bunch of really long-winded and convoluted allegories about the situation so that when people ask me about it, I can just give them some artistic fucking bullshit instead of being like, yeah, we have bad body image and low self-esteem, and that's why we starve ourselves and puke and cut, and we need some help. That would be like a far more honest answer and you know sometimes there isn't a big explanation as to why someone would would do these things most of the time it comes down to control it doesn't always even have to do with weight this whole book is so negative it, it, it until the last three fucking pages which i'll get into that don't worry about that it just says you can't see it can you it just says must not eat for a whole page two whole pages three whole pages who even fucking cares Unnecessary, dumb filler, doesn't add anything. Why'd you put it there? Sure, I remembered it for all the wrong fucking reasons. There's no trigger warnings and through any of this book. There's no nothing like that. There's no, hey, if you need support, call these nothing. There's nothing. Nothing. You're just left with the ending. Since the author has like, obviously been on Proanna blogs, considering she found that Proanna shit and wrote it herself, yet she thought it appropriate to put something like that in the book. I don't even want to tell you how many times I've seen the must not eat thing copied and pasted onto Tumblr. Author knew it. She knew it. She knew where it was going to end up and she put it in there. Fuck you. This is when she talks about starving. It's totally inaccurate, but we're going to read it out. Adrenaline kicks in when you're starving. That's what nobody understands. Except for being hungry and cold, most of the time I feel like I can do anything. It gives me superhuman powers of smell and hearing. I can see what people are thinking. Stay two steps ahead of them. I do enough homework to stay off the radar. Every night, I climb thousands of steps into the sky to make me so exhausted that when I fall into bed, I don't notice Cassie. Then suddenly it's morning, I leap on the hamster wheel and it all starts again. It's not even remotely fucking true. If starving really always gave her all this fucking adrenaline and made her two steps ahead of everyone because she's got such a big fucking IQ, Rick and Morty genius, why'd she crash the car? Why are her parents on to her the whole time about when she's doing fucking ED behaviors? They know what's up. So no, you're not two steps ahead of anybody, except maybe your like nine-year-old sister. And even then, she clearly knows something is up too, so like, no. We can stop glamorizing this now. We can stop, yeah. We can just fucking stop. Also, directly beneath that, 
500 calories a day is working. Truth equals 94 pounds. Stop! Rah! That actually made me so mad. My phone fell over. That's why you know you should fucking stop. Don't say things like this. This is so goddamn reckless. I'm just... Page 222. Oh, this part is where Leah attempts suicide. I was gonna say, oh shit, she Hannah baker My bad. The whole reason she even met this guy in the first place was because the girl was dying said to the guy at the motel, Oh, can you tell my friend Leah she won and I lost? She won and I lost. So the guy calls Leah and tells her that. I win because I'm skinnier. I'm double zero. I stayed strong and didn't try to have my cake and eat it too. I didn't even taste one bite. I pressed my fingertips into my cheekbones. If I rammed my head into a stone wall, I bet I could fracture every bone in my face. The fingers drift over my chin, down my throat, past the butterfly wings of my thyroid, down to where my collarbones hook into my sternum like the wishbone of a bird. Oh my god, you're so dainty. Emma's cats are in the hall, scratching at the bottom of the door to get in. My hands read a braille map hewn from bone, starting with my hollow breast threaded with blue vein rivers thick with ice. I count my ribs like rosary beads, muttering incantations, fingers curling under the bony cage. They can almost touch what's hiding inside. What are you hiding inside there? Ghosts, shadows, and bats, and spooky spiders? You're such a winter girl. My skin slopes down over the empty belly, then around the inside sharp curve of my hip bones, bowls carved out of stone and painted with fading pink razor scars. I twist in the glass, my vertebrae are wet marbles piled on top of another. My winged shoulder blades look ready to sprout feathers. I pick up the knife. She stole a knife from her mom's house. Asshole. The tendons on the back of my hand tense, ropes holding down a tent while the wind blows. Thin scars etch the inside of my wrist, widening to ribbons in the crook of my elbow where I cut too deep in ninth grade. I won. I won. I'm lost. So I'm not gonna get into when she starts cutting herself and has a suicide attempt because it's not really necessary. 259. She like has this little breakdown and she runs away from her parents and she's like I'm gonna go fucking get a pizza for this guy and bribe him into letting me go with him across the country even though I'm like dying and totally fucking crazy and I'm a huge liability and I'll probably die in his fucking car halfway there. So she's known this guy for a couple months and she's been in his presence like I wanna say five times maybe I might even be pushing it. Wanna know what she does after she fucking tries to kill herself? She, she gets up in front of him and she just strips up butt ass naked and shows off all these cuts to him because why the fuck not? And he's just like, can I touch your arm? How much do you weigh? And then he makes her promise to eat and she's like, okay. Cause that's totally realistic, right? Make an anorexic promise that she's gonna eat and she's like, okay, yeah, sure. She convinces him, not really, to let her come with him while he goes across country for winter. She takes too many sleeping pills, so she's passed out for like a whole day. She notices finally that there's a note left behind by Elijah and it says, L. I know you're haunted. It's in your eyes. He's just gone with all her money. She's not even mad. And this is the part where she starts actually dying. So she's in the hotel where her friend died and she's in that room where the guy left her and she has a hallucination of her dead friend and she goes in there and her dead friend is like you're a winter girl leah leah you're crossing over and obviously she doesn't die she finds some quarters uses a payphone to call her mom my cat is meowing so after she like you know almost dies and she gets out of there she goes back to inpatient so we spend 280 something pages deep 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 down in this girl's eating disorder and then her recovery literally takes place in about three fucking pages let's just look up really quickly average recovery time anorexia i'm pretty sure it's at least a few years so with traditional treatment average time to recovery is five to seven years according to dr sarah rabin do you want to explain to me then how she fucking did that in three pages, which is just presumably a few months in this book? There's a reason why the mortality rate for anorexia is so goddamn high. There's a reason why it's the highest out of any mental illness, because it's so fucking hard to recover from. And yet here she is, <laughs> just perfect, just perfect. And there's no mention of any negative side effects. All she just says is that it's hard. I take baby steps because it's hard. No, it's more than hard. It's soul sucking. That is changing your entire ingrained behavior and all of the secrecy and all of the lies that come along with having an eating disorder and trying to hide it from everyone who knows you and loves you. You don't switch that off in a couple months. It's just not fucking realistic. So anyway, I wanna I wanna say one more thing. After the book, 
The author is talking about how she journeyed into the land of the winter girls because of the countless readers who wrote and talked to me about their struggles with eating disorders, cutting, and feeling lost. Well, you did them a really big fucking disservice because you basically wrote them a how-to novel on how to fucking starve yourself better than anyone else and be a total asshole while doing it and feel absolutely no remorse and then just have a fucking magical recovery when you just fucking don't feel like doing it anymore. You did them a big disservice and you wrote a shitty fucking book. You should feel bad. And that's all.